from silk kimonos and South Sea pearls to handmade globes and Moroccan rugs, we travelled the world to uncover the stories behind some of the world's most valuable items. Our first stop is East Ayrshire, Scotland, where a tiny workshop has been making curling stones since 1851. Today, Kays of Scotland is the only company in the world trusted to produce curling stones for the Winter Olympics. Using rare granite from just one island in the world, experienced stonemasons turn these giant boulders into hundreds of uniform curling stones. But these aren't just any curling stones. They're the only ones allowed in the Olympic Games. A single stone certified for the Olympics costs over $600. That makes a full set of 16 stones worth $9,600. So how are Olympic curling stones made? And why are they so expensive? Since 2006, every curling stone used in the Olympic Winter Games has come from here. It's produced stones since 1851, but today there are just 10 people in the world who make them. They love what they do. They're very passionate about it because they know that this particular block of granite they're working on that becomes a curling stone could be the stone that's thrown for the gold medal at the Olympic Games. It could be the stone that decides a world championship. Every stone comes from one tiny island off the coast of Scotland. For over a century, masons have ventured to Elsa Craig Island to harvest granite for curling stones. Until its lease expires in 2050, Case is the only company in the world with permission to harvest granite here. And for curling, Elsa Craig's granite structure is the gold standard. But getting granite to the mainland is far from simple. Well, the harvesting process is, is, is, a, is a logistical <laughs> work of art, I think. There is nothing on the island, as you say, it's uninhabited. There's no water supply other than some running water from, from the, the rivers and streams on the island. There's no electricity supply, so we have to take absolutely everything with us. Kays uses two types of granite from the island to produce curling stones. First, there's blue hone granite, which makes up the layer that runs along the ice. Then common green is used for the part that strikes other stones. This is Ailsa Craig common green granite, so this makes up the full body of the stone. You can also see this slightly lighter grayer color granite inside, and this is Ailsa Craig blue horn. The rock is densely constructed, thanks to how well its fine-grained crystals and the feldspar interlock. This makes the stone resilient. While other rocks might crack or splinter, Elsa Cray granite stays intact amid cold temperatures and collisions. Most other rocks will have imperfections, like veins that cut through the stone. And while it's not free from weaknesses, there aren't many throughout Elsa Craig rock. Weaknesses make it more likely a stone will fracture upon hard impact, something that would upend a curling game. Before Kays can begin making stones, each rock is cut into slabs. But not all the granite the company harvests is suitable for a curling stone. Sometimes areas of a slab have small imperfections that could cause it to erode or impact the game. It's generally because there's a flaw or a fissure or a crack or something in it. This is where the eye of the masons comes in. Throughout the process, they assess the granite and confirm it satisfies Olympic requirements. The slab thickness, we're looking for 145 millimeters, you know, 14.5 centimeters thick. Then that gives us the ideal depth for coring, which then allows us to shape the stone while retaining the weight. From the slab, Case marks only the best parts worth coring, which are the areas it'll eventually shape into stones. We've gone to a lot of time and effort to bring this resource from an island over to the mainland that we want to make the most effective use out of it. We can get boulders off the island that can be in the region of five to seven tons. They will yield way more than five or six cheeses per ton. But if we average it out across a whole harvest, then if we get around six cheeses per ton, we're doing pretty well. They call them cheeses for no clear reason other than... I suppose in one respect, they maybe look like a baby bell cheese or something like that. I've never really thought about it too deeply, to be honest. <laughs> While the process today largely depends on machines, it needs experienced craftspeople to see each stage through. 
The cutting process or the coring process is a skill or an art in itself. So while it's semi-automatic in terms of feeding itself in, the speed is manually controlled and that's where the skill of the operator comes in. After each cheese has been cored, masons chip away the excess stone around the corners and prepare it for shaping. The International Olympic Committee determines the size, shape, and weight of each stone for the games. Before the stone reaches its final shape, masons fit the blue home granite into the common green body. The stone itself weighs 40 pounds, plus another pound for the handle. After it reaches its final form, it's time to polish it. Each stone needs to be uniform in weight, size, and running surface. The running surface on the bottom determines how much the stone curls. To curl, there needs to be friction between the ice and the stone. That roughness is achieved by the experienced hand of a mason. Kayes stores granite over time, returning to Elsa Craig about once a decade. Other producers harvest granite from the Trevor Quarry in Wales. Kayes once sourced granite from Trevor too, but Mark says quality control issues turned it away. And it didn't hurt that the World Curling Federation preferred Elsa Craig stones. They found that the case stones with the insert, the blue horn insert, were the best because they also discovered that having a, a curling stone that's not got a blue horn insert will pit. It will has a certain porosity. It will pull in water, and water and ice will then freeze. When water freezes, it expands, leads to the, the detriment or the damage to the stone. While curling has recently skyrocketed in popularity, demand for stones has fluctuated since the game began. Curling is believed to have started in Scotland, but today, Canada is the most successful team in the history of curling. Curling here goes back to the late 19th century. A curling stone gets some last minute polishing. When many of the Scots who immigrated to Canada brought the game with them. By the 50s, Canada was building hundreds of curling rinks. Now retired, Jimmy Wiley worked at Kay's during this period and saw the company thrive before demand dropped again. When all of these new ice rinks in Canada were satisfied, the demand fell off dramatically. So we went from 25, 30 people down to about between five and 10 people. A major component that's kept the game and K's alive today, the Winter Olympics. When curling was put back into the Olympics, it was, it was great. It was a really, it was a, a momentous moment in terms of, of curling stone manufacture because it suddenly opened curling up to the world. In 1990, there was only 25 countries in the world that were in, in any way involved in curling. And now, 20 years later, that's almost tripled. As of 2022, 67 countries compete in curling. Naturally, that's created an uptick in demand for stones, which has carried over into their price. We have increased our, our sales, which is, is really, really good news. Um, having said that, we've also increased our costs because we'll have to go back for granite more frequently <laughs> and to, to satisfy the demands. In 2000, Kays harvested about 1,500 metric tons of common green and about 300 metric tons of blue hone. 13 years later, it took 2,500 metric tons of common green and 500 metric tons of blue hone. Fortunately for the growing interest in the sport, and for the only supplier of Olympic curling stones, supply isn't a problem. The last harvest in November 2020, we took less than 0.01% of the island. So we're, we're scratching the surface. The whole island is made of granite. We're not making that big a dent in it. With a single tap, Mike Dadson can turn a faulty oboe into one of the world's most expensive instruments. And then hopefully at the end, we should uh, achieve a bottle tight joint. When he's done with it, this oboe will cost almost $14,000. That's more than four times the price of some professional flutes. We would like to say you're only as good as your last oboe, basically. How good was your last oboe? Very good. <laughs> But before it reaches Mike's desk, artisans select, age, and then whittle rare African blackwood into an oboe base just millimeters thick. This nearly endangered wood is just one of the factors limiting the production of quality oboes. 
So what makes an oboe so difficult to make? And is that why they're so expensive? For high-end oboe producers like Howarth of London, it takes five years to make an oboe from start to finish. Oboes are one of the most complicated instruments to make. And because they're prone to cracking, high-end oboes have to be made of the best materials, like this African blackwood. Howarth buys only two square meters of African blackwood a year, which costs it $25,000. And obtaining African blackwood, locally called Mpingo, isn't easy. It's harvested from only the Miombo woodlands of Africa, in countries like Tanzania. And it's a threatened species, and at risk of endangerment. So loggers are only allowed to chop down trees that are over 60 years old. They must submit a request, acquire a permit, and ultimately pay a fee of $151 per cubic meter they export. The scarcity of African blackwood looms large over the industry. African blackwood isn't typically farmed. It grows in the wild. So to combat overharvesting, conservationists in Kilwa, Tanzania, have gone to great lengths to ensure these in-demand trees are managed sustainably. <laughs> na tunajua inapatikana Afrika huko kwa hiyo ni utambulisho ni utambulisho wetu pia kwa hiyo tuna ina, ina historia yake kwa hiyo inabidi tu tuilinde kwa hiyo tunahitaji jukumu la pamoja tusiseme wakala wa huduma za misitu ndo wana jukumu la kuhifadhi peke yake hapana The most valuable part of a log is the heart which becomes the basis of the oboe The oboe is a complex woodwind that supports extensive mechanical keywork it's subject to moisture generated by human breath, making it prone to cracking when made with weaker woods. But the same properties that allow African blackwood to support the complexity of an oboe are also what make it so difficult to work with. The first step in construction is to shape the wood, which requires metalworking equipment. Artisans start by hollowing out what will become the interior of the instrument. Then they sculpt the exterior and refine the shape. This process is carried out carefully over a number of years and with remarkable precision. The fact that we can turn a piece of wood to within two or three hundredths of a millimetre consistently is, is just remarkable really. I mean, most engineering companies are using those tolerances to work with metal. Between each round of shaping, the wood is stored for at least a year to mature. Aging the wood ensures it stays strong and doesn't crack. During the day, we're blowing warm, dry air over the stock. And then at night, the compressors are turned off. And so we're going from hot, cold, dry to damp. So we're really treating that wood stock as badly as we can because we want it to move and change. And if it's going to crack, let's get it out of the system early so we don't waste any time on it. But the wood isn't the only thing that contributes to the overall price. Once the basic shape of the oboe is complete, artisans begin to create the oboe's complex mechanical keywork. After drilling the initial tone holes, workers solder and file the keys to shape by hand. The keys are dipped in silver for protection and are then fitted to the oboe body. Now just a bit more movement. This step alone can take up to 60 hours to complete. According to Howarth, the complexity of the keywork determines the price. The more keys in the oboe, the more expensive it will be. A clarinet has 17 keys typically, whereas an oboe has, you know, almost double that as a student model. And a professional oboe can have as many as 45 keys. Howarth has invested close to £1 million in machinery to ensure each component is of the highest quality. But Howarth says its biggest expense is the craftspeople. The labour required to assemble the oboe accounts for 60 to 80% of Howarth's costs. And it takes years of training to perfect the art of oboe making. Every artisan at Howarth boasts at least 20 years of experience in the craft. Among these artisans is Mike Dadson, one of Howarth's finishers. He's tasked with fine tuning the last few elements of the oboe. One of his most important tasks is fitting cork pads under the keys. Mike sands down different sized corks until they're paper thin. This step is essential because a single air leak will render the oboe useless. 
My engineering needs to be very good on these because I'll be fitting them to the thinness of a uh, very thin cigarette paper. And then hopefully at the end, we should uh, achieve a bottle tight joint. While making an oboe, some of the keys and metal parts will inevitably get slightly bent, and it's Mike's job to fix them. If an oboe has a single imperfection, it can't be sold for top dollar. Fixing bent keys is a test of patience. Sometimes, straightening out one key can bend another piece elsewhere. I found the point where I perceive the bend to be. So hopefully I'll just be able to Mike often takes over three days to fine-tune an oboe, but all this patient work pays off. The oboe is now ready to be sold, but with a five-year-long production time and increasingly rare raw materials, the number of oboes Howarth can make and sell is limited. Its workshop produces only 800 oboes a year, and of those, only 200 are professional grade. Limited production results in higher prices and makes quality instruments hard to come by. I can imagine there are less than 20,000 oboes being sold each year. I know that Yamaha make 20,000 flutes a month, and that's just Yamaha. So the difference in scale is, is absolutely enormous. Oboes are also regarded as one of the most difficult instruments to master. With such a steep learning curve, there aren't enough oboe players to justify production on a scale that would keep prices low. But professional oboe players, like Emily Palethorpe, rely on the continued production of this centuries-old instrument. I think this is my fifth Howarth, and I haven't once had one crack. For Emily, the time and care Howarth puts into each oboe sings through in the end product, so she doesn't mind the high cost. There is no question in my mind that they're worth every penny. To play on something that's so beautifully made, that's such excellent quality, you know, means the world to my um, professional career and um, allows me to just then relax and be the artist I want to be. This is the most important moment in the process of creating a South Sea Pole. The moment when Harry inserts the nucleus into an oyster around which a pearl will form. And if he's imprecise, the resulting pearl may come out misshapen. The goal is this, a near-perfect round pearl with a large 20 mm diameter. That's more than twice the size of the more common Akoya pearl. And this single pearl can sell for $1,500, compared to $75 for a high-grade Akoya pearl. A necklace of near-perfect South Sea pearls can cost over $200,000. So why is making these pearls so much more difficult? And what makes them so expensive? South Sea refers to the southern portion of the Pacific Ocean. In these waters, just off the coast of Lombok, Indonesia, pearl farms like Afdol Pearl are growing cultured pearls. These are pearls that require a human to put something inside an oyster instead of harvesting naturally occurring pearls. And South Sea pearls are the most expensive variety of cultured pearls. That's in part because of how long it takes to make a South Sea pearl. While some freshwater oysters can churn out dozens of smaller pearls within three months, it takes about five years to cultivate a single South Sea pearl. The oyster it comes from, the Pinctada maxima, can only make one at a time. And only a fourth of these oysters survive cultivation. That's why the pearl farmers have to go to great lengths to keep the oysters alive. It starts in this highly controlled laboratory, where lab technicians must create the perfect conditions for oyster larvae to grow into healthy, pearl-producing adults. They have to maintain a room temperature of exactly 20 degrees Celsius and feed the larvae the phytoplankton they need to grow. To do this, they combine salt water from the South Sea and sodium hydroxide and store it for five days until there's enough plankton. Lab techs feed the plankton to nets of baby oysters and monitor their growth for about 45 days. 
that's around the time they reach at least one millimetre in diameter and are old enough to be transferred to sea. The oysters are transferred to save on the costs of rearing bigger oysters, which can get expensive. Yeah, kalau pelihara di darat harus kita bikin planktonnya. Kita beli plankton, kita bikin. Itu biayanya agak besar dia. In the South Sea, the oysters get the warm waters and food they need to mature. But this is also when most of them will die without producing a single pearl. Itu yang akan hidup nanti cuman 25.000 dari 10.000 itu. Eh, 2.500 maksudnya. Karena 75% itu dia pasti meninggal. That's why pearl farmers have to check on the oysters monthly to ensure they're still growing, eating and healthy. They pull the nets of oysters up from the sea and clean the shells. This helps prevent predators from feeding off the oysters and eventually killing them. Ya agar ini kadang kalau kerangnya kotor kan ketutup semua. Jadi susah untuk makan. Di sini banyak lumut, banyak kotoran, banyak bakteri juga. Ada ulat di sini. Kadang-kadang itu yang bisa bikin mutiara jelek. Jadi tujuannya juga untuk kita bangunkan. Kadang-kadang kerang tak mau bangun. After up to two years of nursing, when the oysters are large enough, implantation can begin. For cultured pearls, implantation is the most important step. When a nucleus is implanted, the oyster sees it as an irritant and reacts by building protective layers of nacre around it. This becomes the pearl. Harry is demonstrating where the nucleus is implanted on an opened oyster. Nah, terus yang ini, ini inti namanya. Jadi sebelum masukkan ini terbuat dari kulit kerangnya. He tears the oyster's gonads and injects the nucleus in the middle. He then adds cybo under the nucleus. Cybo is a mantle tissue cut from another oyster that surrounds the implanted nucleus. It's essential to the pearl quality, and without it, the oyster won't produce any pearls at all. Harry is the only person Aftol trusts with this step. That's because the nuclei don't come cheap. Mahmoud buys the nuclei from Japan, and their cost, in addition to import taxes, takes 20% of his profits. And he says getting import permits for these nuclei is difficult preventing him from buying enough to expand his business. After the nucleus is implanted, special attention is paid to how the nacre grows around it to avoid a misshapen pearl. They're working towards a large, almost perfectly round pearl. Workers invert the oysters and put them in their protective nets to bring back to sea. The South Sea pearl's unique, soft, satiny luster and thick nacre are a result of the warm waters it grows in. And a thick nacre means a large pearl. Harry says they must flip them regularly so the nacre grows evenly. Nah, jadi itu tidak boleh terlewatkan dia. Selama 40 hari itu ada schedule-nya. Kita bikin schedule untuk tiga hari. Satu minggu setelah suntik, kita biarkan setelah lubang yang kita robek itu nutup, baru kita bolak-balik. After 40 days, workers remove the oysters from the sea and clean them weekly. Harry checks the implanted oysters monthly to see how the pearl is developing. This is done for up to two years before the first pearl can be harvested. Untuk tiga tahun pertama, itu minimal size-nya dari 0,9 atau 0,8 gram atau bisa dikatakan 7 sampai 11 mm, itu tahap yang pertama, tiga tahun pertama. Itu bijinya itu 1,3 gram lah, minimal 0,8 lah ya. Harry implants the same oyster two more times. Each time, the pearl after all harvests is bigger. By the third harvest, the pearl can reach over 20 millimeters in diameter and over 8 grams in weight. But as much as pearl farmers like Mahmoud invest in the intense care needed to raise the oysters, the outcome is never guaranteed. Mahmoud says only 20% of the oysters that survive make the most valuable kind of pearl. 
almost perfectly round, lustrous, and large. Mahmoud grades the pearls based on size, luster, shape, and color. The larger, rounder, shinier, minimally blemished pearls get the highest grade. That can be triple A or quadruple A, depending on the producer. Mahmoud then sells them to jewelers, like Rihanna Melia, who fashions the pearls into necklaces, earrings, and rings. Rihanna seeks out the highest grade she can find, but it isn't easy. Sangat sulit ditemukan untuk yang bagus. Saya juga kadang-kadang dalam satu hari itu, ini dalam sekarang ini saya minim uh, stok material. Lower grades are more available, but they're rougher, asymmetrical, and lack shine. And in the jewelry world, those are the least desirable. But even the highest grade pearls are not perfectly round. That's because even though they're fond. They're still natural pearls, so finding a near-perfect pearl, let alone enough to make a string necklace, is extremely rare. It took nine years for Rihanna to find enough triple A grade pearls to make this necklace. She is finally able to sell it this year for thirty-six thousand dollars to a local buyer. That makes sourcing these expensive pearls worth it for Rihanna, who relies on farmers to continue to produce high-quality pearls. But Mahmoud says pearl farmers need more support from the government, specifically around making nuclei readily available. Kalau untuk itu sih memang iya, kami bisa apa? Tidak bisa pungkiri ya, bahwa untuk perizinan import ini yang agak sulit. With this kind of support, pearl farmers say they could increase their production and make Indonesian South Sea pearls more readily available internationally. This is Kenji. He's using a centuries-old technique to dye silk for a kimono. It's physically demanding, but that's not the only challenge. He has to match this color exactly, making adjustments by eye. And it's essential that the fabric inside this barrel remains white. Kenji won't know if he's successful until he opens the lid. This is one of over 20 steps required to make a kimono. You can buy a cotton kimono for $300, but a handmade chiso kimono can cost over $10,000. And the company's most expensive kimonos cost 10 times that. We followed 10 artisans step by step to find out what makes these kimonos so expensive. Versions of the kimono have been worn for centuries. Today, the kimono is viewed as formal wear, worn on special occasions like weddings or coming of age ceremonies. Part of the reason why Chiso's kimonos are so expensive is that they're made entirely out of silk. It takes around 12 meters of silk to make a single kimono. Chiso collaborates with a network of highly skilled artisans. Each step is done by hand and can take weeks to complete. This intricate design starts out as a simple sketch. <laughs> Once the design is ready, Hiroshi transfers it to the silk. This step is called drafting, and it can take up to two weeks. Hiroshi ensures that the design looks good when the kimono is worn, not just on a flat surface. These lines are critical to the design process, but you won't see them on the finished kimono. This paint is washed away, after acting as a guide for other artisans. Hiroshi has 37 years of experience, but he's still very critical of his work. Chiso's kimonos are known for their complex patterns, 
painted using a technique called using. Artisans trace the design with a glue-like paste that separates colours when the silk is painted. It also gives a characteristic white outline to parts of the design. It's patient work, but Ai says it's all worth it when she sees the finished kimono. あの、<笑> This is just the start of a months-long process. Pieces of the kimono are sent off to different artisans across Kyoto. Each artisan must perfect their section while keeping in mind the final design. At Yoko's workshop, she dyes the base of the kimono with these large brushes. Yoko and her assistant blend the edges, working around the design. But this isn't the only way kimonos are dyed. Some are dyed using a technique called shibori, which creates bold colors and distinct shapes. But it's very tedious work. Before Kenji starts working, artisans sew up the silk and bind this barrel. The seam Hiromi is sewing forms the edge of the design. Then, Matsuyama wraps the silk along this wooden tub and tacks it into place before he attaches the lid. This step is key to preventing dye from bleeding inside. Now, it's time for Kenji to dip the silk. He works quickly, but constantly monitors the silk to ensure it's dyed correctly. If the barrel remains in the dye for too long, the colors will start to bleed. Kenji cuts a strip of fabric, compares it to the swatch, and adjusts his dye accordingly. After the dyeing is complete, Kenji lifts the lid and examines his work. All of these steps combine to tell a story through the design of the kimono. Themes of nature or the seasons are common, while some designs reference poems or plays. One of the most skilled and delicate steps is the yuzen dyeing. Tomoko has 25 years of experience making kimonos. Yuzen dyeing has been practiced for centuries and has become an iconic feature of high-end kimonos. The technique is more expensive and time-consuming than screen printing but Chiso's customers are willing to pay a premium for the result. Long-sleeved kimonos with complicated designs can take two to three weeks to paint. これを合わすにはだいたいどうしたらいいかっていうのはもう書いてるっていうことです。あの数字にはできない。<笑> 
ので<笑>技術的に難しいものはやはりあの写実調のいわゆる自然のままのような花でありますとか草加紋っていうのの,あの The final step in the process is for artisans to apply gold leaf and embroider complex designs. Embroidery alone can take weeks to months depending on the design. The more embroidery a kimono has, the more expensive it will be. When all the pieces fall into place, the finished kimono is a work of art, a testament to the skill of each artisan who has worked on the silk. Kimono is a work of art, a testament to the skill of each artisan who has worked on the silk. The kimono is a work of art, a testament to the skill of each artisan who has worked on the silk. それはやっぱりこう機械ではなかなかできない本当にこう細部の美しさであったりまあこういった展示をするときにえまあ柄がしっかり見えやすいように仮のえ仮縫いを行っているという状態がえ販売されている状態ですまずまあお客様の寸法を採寸をしてである程度はあの規定の寸法で押し立てはするんですね。Chiso's kimonos take six to twelve months to make, and those hundreds of hours of labor are reflected in the price. Most range from seven thousand dollars to fourteen thousand dollars, but some of Chiso's elaborate designs cost over one hundred thousand dollars. And the accessories traditionally worn with a kimono increase the price even more. The kimono is why it is so expensive. It is why どれだけ手を加えたかっていうそれは友禅の細かさであったりまあもちろん分量も関係してきますし Customers looking for less expensive kimonos might choose to rent or to buy refurbished ones which usually cost a few hundred dollars but still provide good quality Buying a cotton kimono or one without complex yuzen is much more affordable These kimonos are often worn for less formal events But current demand for expensive, complex kimonos is low. Kimono sales declined dramatically in the 90s during Japan's economic crash, and the industry has continued to shrink. Today, it's around 14% of the size it was in 1975. Shiso sells around 4,000 kimonos each year, but the relevance of the garment in modern life is limited. やっぱりこうちょっとこう着物にやっぱ日本人だから着物に目覚めてきたっていう方と。Further complicating matters, the artisans it relies upon to maintain production are getting older. でそのやっぱり伝統的な技術はあのやっぱりその職人の技術力がまあ高いっていうことが条件なんですが、だいたい職人さん今。で六十代とか七十代の方たくさんいらっしゃるんで、三十年以上あの仕事してていただいている方が多いと思います。今新しい職人さんを見つけるのはあのやっぱりそういう職人の仕事をやりたいっていうそういう若い方もいらっしゃいますんで、まあただ全体的には職人の数はやっぱり減っていってますね。The future of this centuries-old clothing tradition depends on the skill of the artisans who practice it. Ed Zerul is carving out the final details of this Meerschaum pipe. And when he's done, a pipe like this can cost over $300. It's made of Meerschaum. A mineral rock often found in underground mines in Turkey that reach 137 meters deep. The most intricate pipes can take up to two months to complete. Those can go for over seven thousand dollars. But Meerschaum is fragile, which means Ertuğrul can lose all his work at the last minute. <laughs> Dur, 
So what sets meerschaum pipes apart from the rest? And why are they so expensive? Lötaş pipo da e, içim olabildiğince iyidir. Çünkü sebebiyeti şudur. Ağaç içerken ağacın e, kendine özgü bir koku ve tadı vardır. Ama Lötaş'ın da sadece içmiş olduğumuz tütünün tadını alırız. Turkish people have been making meerschaum pipes since the early 1600s. Meerschaum, also known as sepialite, is a clay-like mineral. It's lightweight, porous and heat resistant, making it ideal for pipe smoking. Its porousness allows it to absorb tar and nicotine, reducing how much is inhaled, which some pipe smokers prefer. Meerschaum is found all over the world, but the most commercially important meerschaum is mines near Eskişehir in Turkey. It's locally referred to as white gold for its economic and cultural value. To make meerschaum pipes, artisans first seek the highest quality meerschaum, known as the right grade. The higher the grade, the less prone the meerschaum is to cracking, so they're willing to pay more than double the price of the lower sandy grade. The right grade of meerschaum is rare and difficult to obtain. Meerschaum is located in underground quarries, and here in Gozlubel, miners have found high-grade meerschaum. Emery now carves pipes, but he got his start in the industry as a miner. He's taking us 44 meters below ground, where he'll chisel at surrounding rocks to find suitable meerschaum. Miners make educated guesses as to where to start, typically near deposits they've already mined. The work is physically demanding, and even the strongest laborers can take an hour to remove just one stone. But that's only if they find it. Çünkü e, yeri geliyor e, bir kuyuda günlerce çalışılmasına rağmen. The goal is to find larger meerschaum rocks that are at least the size of a fist. Oh, very nice. Çok güzel bir lotaşı bulduk. This stone can sell for at least thirty-eight dollars. Emre says larger meerschaum has higher heat resistance, up to four thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Tadı güzel. The bigger the meerschaum stone, the more elaborate and eventually the more expensive the pipe will be. But artisans like Emre can only make as many pipes as the meerschaum supply allows. İsteğimiz tekrar daha fazla sal almak ama yer altından çıkan sayı ne kadarsa biz onları alıyoruz. Though Emre can spend up to two thousand two hundred dollars at a time on raw meerschaum. That's still not enough to meet the demand for the finished pipes. Yapacağımız piponun madenini kendimiz çıkarttık yerinden. Hadi gidelim Eskişehir'e. Ertuğrul Çever is one of the few master pipe carvers in all of Turkey. He's been making meerschaum pipes for over 50 years. Aside from the cost of the meerschaum itself, the final price of these pipes comes down to skill and craftsmanship. To start making the pipe, Ertuğrul removes any dirt from the stone and cuts around fault lines that may later cause it to break. This sometimes means lopping off three quarters of the meerschaum stone. He then carves out the rough shape of the pipe. He air dries the pipe to strengthen it, then drills in guide holes for the mouth and body. Ertuğrul refines the pipe again with four different sandpapers to remove any flaws and to ensure a smooth surface. Simpler pipes like these can sell for over $100, but complex pipes like this Ottoman sultan head require further handiwork, which can triple the price. Ertuğrul doesn't plan the design for his pieces. He works from memory and feel, so each of his pipes is a unique work of art. After hand carving every minor detail, Ertuğrul starts shaping the stem. The stem's materials can vary. Ebonite is used for more expensive pipes, while acrylic is used for more affordable ones. 
The stem is polished, then fit into the mouth of the pipe. Next, Erdrul dips the pipes in beeswax, which adds a sheen and further hardens the meerschaum, prolonging its durability. But even when worked by skilled hands like Erdrul's, the meerschaum is liable to break unexpectedly at any point in the process. <laughs> The risk of this happening, especially with complex pipes that can take up to two months to complete, means sometimes Erdurul's work is all for nothing. But when he can finish a pipe, it can be sold for top dollar. When I sold people to the road, I sold the most people to the road to $3,000-$4,000. Çünkü alım gücü e, fazla olan ürüne rağbet ederiz biz. Meerschaum pipes at this price point are typically large, intricate collectibles that are also functional. Bu bu elimde gördüğünüz pipaların büyük çoğunluğu benim e, elimdeki koleksiyonun sadece en eski parçalarından oluşuyor. Çünkü bunların büyük bir çoğunluğu 1800 yıllardan e, ve 1700 yıllardan olan pipolar, 200-250 yaşlarında olan pipoların koleksiyonudur. Today, Meerschaum pipes are in high demand by collectors and smokers alike. But that hasn't always been the case. Around the turn of the millennium, a rise in anti-smoking laws and the availability of alternative materials created the market for Meerschaum pipes. Things took a turn in 2011, with the rise of tourism in Turkey after the Arab Spring. As tourism continued to increase, Emre saw Meerschaum pipes regain popularity. And the global pipe industry is set to grow even further at a rate of 4.5% by 2031. Yet as demand for Meerschaum pipes increases, Erdurul fears the profession can't keep up. Biri bitti, biri başladı. Ve şu anda da belki de altın dönemini yaşıyor yani. Ham madde pahalı olmasına rağmen. Geleceğe açısından bizim tereddütümüz yetişen sanatkarın olma işi. Eğer bu devam ettirilirse bakıyorduk fakat şu anda yetişen genç nesilde o ustalarımızdan daha iyi usta olabilen bir sürü yetenekli insan oluştu yani. It can take 30 kilos of raw wool to make a single Moroccan rug. Women tie each knot by hand, one row at a time. Instead of using guides, they work from their imagination. When sold online, authentic rugs can cost over $2,000. But the women who make them often receive the least profit. The most Fadma has sold a rug for? $600. Most of the profits are taken by middlemen, who buy the rugs from artisans and sell them for several times more in big markets. Authentic rugs also compete with knockoffs made outside of Morocco. Today, Dozens of cooperatives are working together to fight for a fair wage. We went to Morocco to find out why these artisans struggle to earn a profit, while the rugs are so expensive. Deep in the Atlas Mountains, there are thousands of artisans weaving rugs like this. They've been woven throughout Morocco for centuries by Amazigh tribes. <laughs> Fadma has been making rugs her whole life. She says weaving is much more than just a job. Her day starts with making bread. Besides weaving, the women here are responsible for childcare and household chores. Artisans use wool from local sheep. But there's a lot of work to do before this wool is ready to weave. Raw wool starts out like this. Artisans carry the wool to a nearby river to wash it 
removing any dirt or debris. Once the wool dries, artisans spin it into yarn. These large combs untangle the fibres in a process called carding. Artisans spin the wool two times, combining threads for a sturdier result. It's patient work, but Fadma says working together makes it more enjoyable. These women are part of the Kaspa Tuznacht Cooperative, one of around 50 in the region. Their aim is to help each other weave and to sell rugs directly, cutting out the middlemen. Having several artisans is especially useful when weaving a large rug. They measure out the length and hammer two stakes into the ground. Artisans walk the yarn back and forth dozens of times to start the rug. The rest of the rug is woven into this base. From here, artisans unravel the yarn and attach it to the loom. This marks the start of weeks of work. Moroccan rugs are thick, soft and durable thanks to the wool from local mountain sheep. The Bach has around 300 sheep and goats. He shears them in March and sells most of the wool to weavers. Australia. <laughs> The Bach sells his wool for around $10 per kilogram. Back at the cooperative, artisans are busy dyeing the wool. They use natural ingredients that create rich and varied colours. Artisans mix alum stones in boiling water to help the yarn absorb the dye. Fatma uses ingredients like rosemary and henna. She uses pomegranate peel to make yellow. Keeping track of what the raw materials cost and factoring that into the price of a rug is another challenge. Artisans who use natural dyes instead of chemical dyes need more raw materials. And some of these ingredients, like madder, a root used for red dye, are expensive when bought in large amounts. This dyed yarn forms Fadma's palette of colours that she weaves into the base to form a design. When all the materials are ready, Fadma starts to weave. <laughs> Each knot is tied individually, one row at a time. After decades of practice, Fadma is able to quickly weave dyed yarn through the base. Each region of Morocco has its own designs and motifs. Like Benil Rhine from the Middle Atlas, or Taznacht works from northwestern Africa, 
which use several weaving techniques to create complex patterns. On large rugs, artisans work side by side. The more complicated the pattern, the harder it is to weave. Large rugs can take months to make. And the bigger the rug, the more expensive it becomes. واحد العمال اللي خدامين كنا خدامين فيه واعطينا الوقت كثير ليه غنسترحوا وكنجتهدوا وكنخدموا بزاف بكري غادي ناخذوا واحد شويه د الراحه عاوتاني كنفرحوا بديك الساعه شويه Unfortunately weaving a beautiful rug doesn't guarantee a profit Most weavers live and work in rural areas with limited access to transportation they don't have access to the markets and are exploited by middlemen. These obstacles make it challenging for women to sell their rugs directly. لا المشكل دابا عندنا حيت ما قارينش وهذا الجيل الجديد اللي قاري راه ما مسوق لهذا العمل وحنا اللي اللي بغينا هذا العمل خصنا شويه التكاوين والقرايه باش نبيعوا لريوسنا ديريكت كنتمنوا ان شاء الله ان يكون عندنا سيت في في الانترنت والفيسبوك وبعدا نتعلموا حتى حنا كيفاش غادي نتواصلوا مع الزبون باش نربحوا حتى حنا Several direct trade companies partner with weavers and pay a higher price for their rugs. After shipping costs and import taxes, the final price of a large rug can easily exceed $1,000. But the pay artisans receive from these companies varies. It can range from only 20% to over 60% of the price you see online. Within Morocco, rugs are sold in markets like this that can be found across the country. Janah has sold rugs for 30 years. He says his customers are around 60% locals and 40% tourists. ثالث حاجه هي الزربيه الوزقيتيه قديمه اللي معروفه باللون الصفر الزعفران والالوان الطبيعيين الابيض والاسود ويمكن تستعمل على على جوج جهات الجهه ديال الصيف والجهه ديال الشتاء كاينه هذه هذه تتسمى الزليج الامازيغي لا موزيك واحد لا بارتي فيها لينو وفيها تيسي وفيها روبروداج قديما الزربيه كانت ما تتباع ما تتشرى في المغرب كانت كانوا تيعطيوها في الهدايا وتتعطى في الاعراس مدن دابا تبارك الله راه عايشين فيها الناس وقراوا فيها وعايشين فيها وداروا فيها المسائل. But the further a rug gets from the weaver, the more expensive it becomes. And while joining a cooperative can help increase pay, it doesn't guarantee it. الوسطاء هما اللي تيرحوا بزاف. اللي تيديو لبرا لمراكش واكادير وفاس تيبيعوا على برا اما بالنسبه للبائع ديال التعاونيات تيديوها شويه ولكن المراه بزاف هي اللي ضيعت بزاف من ناحيه البيع ديال الزربيه بالنسبه للزربيه دابا تتباع هنا ب 500 درهم للمتر كاري تتمشي عند واحد تيبيعها ب 700 درهم وتتمشي لمراك تتباع بواحد 1500 للمتر كاري ولا 2000 درهم دوبل دوبل مرات اكثر Authentic wool rugs also compete with rugs made outside of Morocco that imitate traditional designs. Some of these are made of wool, but many use cotton or polyester. Like many traditional crafts, passing on rug making has been a challenge. <laughs> Hadi, şebab, 
قالوا لك راه صعيبه الخدمه اصلا صعيبه الخدمه وهما الاخرايا وقالوا لك راه ما ما فيها لا لانتريت وما فيها كما فيها كما But these artisans say it's important to preserve this tradition. بالنسبة للزربية الأمازيغية والزربية الطزناخ ما يمكنش تنطار نقار ما لقاش فيها الموروث الثقافي ديال ديال المنطقة وفيها العيش ديال الساكنة. الجيل كيدوز هذا هو تتوارث ماشي تتعلم. الزربية موروث الزربية موروث ثقافي ديال البلاد حيت فيها المعيشة وفيها كت كتعمر لك الوقت ديالك وكتخرجي شي حاجه من من راسك حيت ماشي غير كنخدموا كنبدعوا كتعب كنعبروا في الزربيه داكشي علاش ما كنحسوش بالتعب ديالها حيت كنبغيوها If these artisans make a single mistake laying a flat map over this giant custom sphere, they'll have to start the entire process over. The slightest twitch of the finger can cause a rip, a costly hiccup at Bellaby & Co Globe Makers, where the world's most expensive globes are made. A 22 centimeter mass-produced globe can cost about $25, while a Bellaby globe of the same size can sell for over $3,800 and prices can reach six figures for Bellaby's largest globes. That's partly because artisans customize these globes entirely in-house, including hand-painting the globe and crafting the base it sits on. So, what makes these globes worth waiting up to two years to get, and why are they so expensive? If someone asks um, why it's so expensive, I invite them along to the studio and show them around and show them the process as we go through at every single level. When they leave, they fully understand why it takes so long. Peter Bellaby founded London's Bellaby & Co Globe Makers in 2008, and today it's one of the only studios in the world making globes by hand. The smallest globe it sells, the 12 centimeter diameter pocket globe, can set you back almost $2,000. Its largest, the Churchill, has a 127 centimeter diameter and costs over $94,000. Since 2008, Bellaby has sold around 5,000 globes, ranging from maps of the Earth to the constellations and even the moon. Three of those were featured in Martin Scorsese's Hugo, including a 40 centimeter celestial globe. Production is limited because making a globe from scratch, entirely by hand, is no easy feat. At Bellaby, it requires cartographers, globe makers, painters, and woodworkers. And the price of these globes is largely a reflection of how many the team can make without compromising quality. The attention to detail starts with the spheres. Most sizes are made from fiberglass for its strength and durability. But what's most important is that it's a perfect sphere. Any deformation can result in uneven weight distribution, which affects how the globe spins. If that happens, Bellaby has to fix it by attaching a counterweight. Then there are the maps themselves. The cartography department focuses on accuracy and fulfilling the customer's imagination, like adding the Silk Road or the Spice Roots. They highlight the places where they came from and where they might have immigrated to and where they got married and where their ancestors are from. But Bellaby doesn't just customize its maps for creative or sentimental reasons. The details also affect where the company can sell its globes. For instance, in India, I can actually go to prison for six months if I ship a globe to India that doesn't have the correct border between India and Pakistan. And if any territories shift or new borders are drawn, Bellaby's newer iterations will reflect that. When the cartographers are done with all the necessary specifications, they print the map onto oblong strips called gauze. Now it can be handed off to globe makers like Eddie. So with globe making, it's all about applying 12 or 24 gauze onto the sphere. So it all starts with cutting those gauze very, very precisely with a scalpel. 
Makers have to cut the gauze to within 0.1 of a millimeter so there are no gaps or overlaps when they're applied. You could very easily cover an entire country based on the amount that you've extra overlapped because you've cut a little bit too much excess. Eddie traces the latitude and longitude lines onto the sphere as guides. Then, he wets the gauze and glues them onto the surface, gently flattening them by hand. Even the slightest tension or miscalculated movement can cause a rip or wrinkle. When globe makers do make mistakes, they have to scrape off and replace the offending gore. If they're lucky, they'll only need to remove one, but sometimes the team has to redo the entire globe, including the cartography. A lot of the times it does result in the globe being restarted, um, and that can even be at the final stage just before it's been packaged. While that doesn't happen often when it does, you know, everybody's upset, but um, it, it's just the only way that we can maintain a really high quality standard. Correctly setting a single gore onto the massive Churchill globe can take an hour. Aside from size, factors like the temperature in the room or the consistency of the glue affect application time. The globe maker has to account for all of this, including their own breathing. I found that cold showers actually help a lot with controlling breath, uh, and that's really improved my making, actually. <laughs> it takes up to 18 months for trainees to learn the most basic aspects of globe making and much longer to master it. Eddie has been on the job for six years. When the gauze are finally set, the globe is ready for the painters, like Isis. She can bring the earth, the moon, or the constellations to life. She shades in the coastlines, mountain ranges, political borders, and any illustrations or customizations. The difficulty on this stage is actually making all these gores the same color and consistent. It's almost like if you're making a painting, but you have 12 different canvases and there has to be a continuation. Some globes highlight different ocean depths, so Isis has to paint in ocean trenches in their exact location. She works deliberately, being careful not to paint neighboring countries the same shades or let any watercolor run from one gore to the next. That's another mistake that risks having to start the whole globe all over again. At the wood shop, artisans are working on a base for the nearly complete Churchill globe. It's all done in-house by a dedicated team of four. They engrave, chisel and stain the wood based on customer specifications. At every stage of the globe-making process, Peter encourages his team to take as long as they need. It's very important that we spend the time that is required to make every single globe as best as it can be. It's finished when it's finished and when it's ready. The cost of labour accounts for most of the price since it usually takes four to six months to complete a globe and ship it out. But Bellaby also pays attention to the materials it uses. The inks it uses for printing can last between 80 and 200 years in gallery conditions. The origin story of Bellaby Globes is just as peculiar as the globes themselves. In 2008, Peter decided to make a globe for his father's 80th birthday. He went through hundreds of globes and thousands of pounds before he was happy with the result. In about 2011, 12, I sold my house um, to fund because this is a bottomless pit of money. I used to go down to the municipal dump every two weeks with a with an estate car full of trial globes. And once he got it right, he wanted to keep making them. But Peter didn't expect the warm reception these boutique globes received. The company was recently commissioned to work on a globe for the Louvre, and its largest globe has a wait list of two years. Peter attributes this demand to the rise of consumer interest in handmade products. The global handicraft market size reached $680 billion in 2021 and is expected to exceed a trillion dollars by 2027. Bellaby & Co. too has seen this consistent rise in demand for its handmade globes. The company says it turns multi-million dollar revenues year after year. And it expects this to continue, even at high price points for its niche products. 
What I love so much about what we do is that it is so deeply personal. You can tell someone's whole life story in it. Making Fang Jia Yugi starts here, with molten bronze. And after hundreds of hammer strokes, it's transformed into some of Korea's most expensive tableware. Artisans work with fires over 1,300 degrees Celsius, carefully reheating the metal between rounds of hammering. Too hot and it will melt. Too cold and it'll shatter. No molds are used in this process, only skill and an experienced eye. When it's done, this rice pot can sell locally for over $350. So what makes Bangjayugi so labor intensive? And is that why it's so expensive? Bangjayugi refers to Korean hand-forged bronzeware. It can take many forms, from pots to gongs. While Bangja Yugi production has largely been modernized, Lee Bangju is one of few Yugi masters who continue to produce certain pieces using traditional methods. Bangju, who is 96, has been making traditional Korean bronzeware for over 70 years. In 1983, the South Korean government declared him a living national treasure. A single spoon fully handcrafted by Bongju's team costs $70. A set of seven bowls costs over $1,800. Bongju starts off by measuring the ingredients. The perfect bronze alloy for Bongju Yugi is in the details. An exact ratio of 78% copper and 22% tin. The metals are heated to over 1300 degrees Celsius in order to melt and boil. Although the alloy will melt at a lower temperature, Bongju says that heating it to 1300 degrees ensures it can stretch without cracking once cooled. They then pour the molten alloy into a heated stone with a round cutout. Once the alloy cools, it becomes a bronze plate with a rounded bottom, referred to as a baduk. Bongju's team heats the cooled baduks again, so they can hammer them without risking breakage. One person cannot hammer the bronze alone, as they won't be able to move fast enough before the metal cools. Working quickly in a circle, artisans strike the red-hot baduk, stretching it until it's the desired size. Each careful blow of the hammer plays an essential role in shaping valuable yugi. This also means one misplaced hit could cause irreparable damage. And it's not just the hammering that can ruin the baduk. Every step of the traditional process is manual, down to fanning the fire. Fanners push and pull the bellows, creating wind to keep the fire going. They depend on experience to determine how hot the fire is. And if they allow it to get too hot, the bronze melts. This particular fanner is still in training. Any defects and the bronze can't be sold. It has to be taken out of circulation, remelted, and processed all over again. After another round of hammering, Bongju cuts the baduk into a circle to the desired diameter. The baduk is then heated back up to working temperature, and the artisans begin another cycle of carefully hammering and shaping. Artisans stack the baduks on top of each other to shape multiple pieces simultaneously. This is efficient, 
but it's also safer than working them one at a time. Stacked bronze plates don't cool as quickly, so they're less likely to break. And broken metal doesn't just ruin the product, it can also be dangerous. Still, only a month later, Bongchi went back to work. Once the pot takes form, Bongchu can separate the layers, revealing multiple roughly shaped pots. His team then refines their shapes individually. The pot is repeatedly shaped, trimmed, and shaped again, all freehand, under the skilled and watchful eye of Master Bongju. Bronzeworking arrived in Korea around 1300 BC. The art form peaked starting in the 9th century AD when it began to be exported to neighboring countries like China and Japan. The demand for Bangja Yugi fluctuated over time, but in the 1980s, producers saw interest in the bronzeware pick up. That's Bongju's son. He's been making Bangja Yugi for 40 years. He says Bangja is still popular in Korea. Part of its appeal is its antibacterial and antiseptic properties, particularly against bacteria like E. coli. But this demand created the necessity to modernize to supply more Bangja Yugi while cutting down production costs. Back at the workshop, Bongju's team is almost done making a rice pot. Once the pot is in its near final shape, they quench it by dunking it in water. This removes some of the oxidized layers and prepares the pot for the last stage, shaving off the surface to reveal the soft toned bronze underneath. Due to the high demand for quality bangja and the need to sustain his business, Bongju too has mechanized some of the process. Even then, it requires highly skilled labor, as many stages are still performed by hand. But for Bongju, it's not about how much Bangja Yugi he can make or how much he can sell it for. After crafting the hand-designed head and customizing the shaft, there's still one step that could make the work on these Honma golf clubs all for nothing. If they make a mistake during assembly, the instant adhesive will immediately dry, meaning countless hours of work and thousands of dollars will be wasted on a single golf club. A full set can retail for more than $50,000. Compared to the estimated $4,400 it would cost to buy a set to match Tiger Woods, so, are the small custom details enough to enhance a golfer's game? And is that why these golf clubs are so expensive? 
At Honma's factory in Sakata, Japan, there are roughly 200 specialized craftspeople. But the most skilled are called Meisho, or Master Craftsmen, and there are only 33 with this title. To earn it, a craftsperson has to train for five years, then pass an exam. A Meisho has the ability to create nuanced elements of a golf club that can be customized down to the finest details. For example, the five-star model of Honma's Beres clubs includes materials like platinum and 24-karat gold. But before those luxury flourishes are ever added, Honma sets itself apart in its modeling process. All golf clubs are split into three main parts, the head, the shaft, and the grip. Creating a master model is the first and most important step in producing a club's head. Satoru Hatanaka is using a more traditional material to create the template for a driver. While historically, drivers were made of persimmon wood, today, they're made with lightweight carbon and titanium. But at Honma, the model the driver is based on is still made from persimmon. Why? So craftsmen like Satoru, who has been making driver models for 35 years, can sculpt the head of the club by hand. The head of an iron needs a different process. Master craftsman Takumi Sato is making the model for a Beres Series 7 iron. When complete, this iron can cost over $1,000 on its own. His model will be used to manufacture the final irons, which are crafted from top-of-the-line carbon steel. Satoru and Takumi are able to visualize what the shape of the final club will look like, but they can't see everything. For this, Honma needs to bring in a different kind of expert. CAD, or Computer Aided Design, allows specialists to design the parts of a club that a human cannot see on the outside. CAD creates a 3D scan of the head of the club. Then, specialists will determine the thickness of carbon and titanium needed and run simulations to test the club's integrity. Meanwhile, in a different part of the Sakata factory, craftspeople create the club's shafts. And while other golf club manufacturers often outsource the shaft, Honma makes every one of theirs in-house. The shafts of the Beres clubs are designed to recover as quickly as possible to their original shape after swinging. The shaft begins with a strong material called high modulus carbon fiber. This is the highest grade of carbon fiber, often used to make professional racing bicycles. This is cut and wrapped around a metal rod called a mandrel. Yeah. Paper 
、男性率の高い、えー、シートを巻く,巻く際には、徐々に徐々に、ゆっくり、やっぱりこれも人の加減が必要で。Even at this stage of the process, the handmade elements of design are highly customizable. And an expert human eye is required for every last detail, including the paint. 機械では出せない、えー、微妙な色の変化をあの手作業だとできると思います。はい、えー、これは同じ塗料なんですけども、塗料の引くスピードでこれだけ色が変わります。Honma invented its very own pull-through method for this step, a unique skill that allows craftspeople to have total control over the outcome of the shaft appearance. その同じゴルフセットはセットものなんで。同じ色に合わせないとあのセットにならないので、あの低スピード一定のスピードで何本も引くのが難しいところですね。This method isn't all about looks either。それでやっぱりあの仕動きで塗った方が鼓膜が薄いあの機械で塗るより薄いので、えー、そういう。Once every last detail of the club is perfected, there is one more step that must be done just right. If the assembly goes wrong, the work of the previous master craftsman could be for nothing. It's a bit difficult. I'm using a set of glue, so I'm using a soft bond. It's not a mistake. まあ、一瞬で形を決めてしまうというところがまあ難しいですね。こう一瞬でこう向きをこう変えるっていうか、これを一日ずっと通してやってますので、集中力を切らさないということが。When a shaft is complete, it is balanced and tested to make sure that the spine or stiff inner core is set to a six o'clock angle on every club. But there's still room for customization. Up until the very end. クラブ組み立てると、まあそれなりに組み立てられるんですけれども、少しこうフラットにしてくださいとか、少しこうフェースの角度をもうちょっとつけたりとか、そこを差し方で調整、まあそんな感じですね。振りやすくしてくださいとか、まあそんな感じで調整が可能なんで。To make sure the measurements are exactly right. Honma uses a robotic arm to test out their clubs. Ah, now it's just a bit of a mess. Honma Golf started in 1958 as a driving range in Surumi, Yokohama. At that time, most of the golf clubs sold in Japan were foreign clubs. In 1982, they started manufacturing their own clubs at the Sakata factory. In response to domestic demand, やはり日本人の体型がまあ平均身長がすごく欧米のあの平均身長と比べると日本はこう低いと思うんですね。日本人に合うクラブを作りたいっていうのがそもそものあの始まりだったらしいです。Around 2015, Honma made a push for popularity in the North American market, but the company's clientele in Japan will always have. The added advantage of customizing clubs at the Sakata factory, and Japan's pro golfers know it well. The buttons on this accordion are made from mother of pearl. The inner lining of certain seashells. For a full-sized accordion with more than 100 buttons, Pagini spends about 600 euros on this part alone. That's four times the cost of acrylic buttons on standard accordions. This attention to materials is why Pagini accordions can sell for nearly 40,000 euros. 
But do Pigini accordions sound any different? And why else are they so expensive? The Italian town of Castelfidardo is known as the accordion capital of the world. And here, Pigini makes some of the world's most expensive accordions. Like the one played by Ludovica Borsati, who swears by Pigini accordions for their sound. Really, mechanically, they are perfect and they are really, really, really complex. While all accordions have three basic components, keys are buttons on the right and left sides and bellows in the middle, most Pagini accordions have a lot of individual parts, over 12,000. Each one is necessary for creating a richer sound, according to the Italian brand. And they're made with high quality and expensive materials. Per costruire una fisarmonica occorrono innumerevoli materiali, dal legno all'alluminio, al cartone, alla madre perla. E... È una, una cosa incredibile di quanti materiali occorrono. Infatti qua occorre anche lavoro di sartoria, ad esempio che costruisce i manali, qua sono tutti cuciti, questo è un cuoio, poi sotto c'è il cuscino per, per la mano, per non, non disturbare la mano mentre suoni. Take those expensive buttons, for example. According to Adriano, a master craftsman at Pigini for over 50 years, the company uses Mother of Pearl because it doesn't get sticky or slippery and it stays cool even after hours of playing. While the buttons improve the playing experience, the wood used on a pigini is what impacts the sound. Diciamo che il segreto è eh, nello stesso legno trovare il legno che sia il più sonoro possibile. To achieve this, pigini uses a secret combination of wood. And though the company won't reveal the exact blend, it includes mahogany, maple and cedar. But these don't come cheap. Pigini says a square meter of cedar alone costs almost 5,000 euros. And it's not just about the right blend of woods, but how the wood is cut. If it's not as straight as possible and the grains are interrupted, the sound it produces isn't as rich. When it comes to the 12,000 different parts, Pigini is meticulous, even down to the glue that holds it all together. The company prefers not to use generic vinyl glues because they're water-based and rubbery, which would dampen the accordion's sound. Delle, delle colle che praticamente sono fatte a base di, di osso. Queste quando si seccano cristallizzano e diventa come un vetro e quindi dove ci sono le giunture dei legni è come se continuasse la circolazione del suono. Higher quality materials come at a higher cost, but this isn't the only reason Pigini accordions are expensive. Adriano says it's the cost of labor that ups the price. From the mother of pearl buttons to the reeds and levers, the thousands of pieces in each accordion are carefully installed by hand. Each slat is made by hand, shaved by hand, and nailed by hand. The wood and leather skin are glued by hand, Per fare questa occorre quasi come assemblare un'auto in, in, in alta costruzione, molto altamente meccanizzata. The metal parts on the left side alone take over 60 hours to install correctly. That's at least a week of work for a single element. That's why completing an accordion like the Pagini Nova takes over a year. And only 20 are made each year. But according to Pigini, tuning is one of the hardest parts. Tuning a smaller accordion can take only a few hours, but larger, more complex models take up to 30 hours for the reeds alone. It starts with this robot arm Pigini bought and reprogrammed to test the tongues on these metal reeds. The accordion produces sound when air passes through the thin tongues of the reeds. And there are over 500 reeds in a free bass accordion. That's over 1,000 notes that have to be tuned to perfection. The reeds are then installed, and the notes are retuned by hand by one of four expert tuners like Lorenzo. He lifts each tongue to make sure air can move around it freely when it's played. He also adjusts both sides of each reed to ensure they're on key. And once the accordion is fully assembled, retuning can take up to a month. 
That's intensive, compared to the couple of hours it takes to retune a piano. Another reason these accordions cost so much is because of the brand's historic reputation as an innovator. La Pigini è rinomata proprio perché noi abbiamo più della metà della produzione è proprio data dalle fisarmoniche a bassi sciolti. Meaning most of its accordions are built to play both bass notes and melodies at the same time. The more common Stradella bass system plays bass notes with only a few chord options for melodies. The free bass accordion, on the other hand, can play various melodies in the right and left hands, along with bass notes. Pagini achieved this by developing a more complex model for a converter in 1961. Its converter expanded the accordion's sound capabilities, but didn't make the instrument any heavier. Se passo in bassi sciolti, schiaccio lo stesso bottone. Ho una scala cromatica come se fosse una tastiera. It's also the most expensive part of Pigini's free bass accordions. The converter, along with the cost of installing it, accounts for almost a third of an accordion's price. Other companies have tried replicating its mechanics because in the accordion world, the lighter an instrument, the better it is for musicians and the more notes an accordion can play, the more valuable it is. E proprio con i bassi sciolti è venuto eh, proprio l'era della musica classica, con, eh, con eh, la fisarmonica bassi sciolti suonano Bach come se tu sentissi un organo da chiesa. Però eh, ti dimostra quanto questo strumento sia, abbia enormi capacità di espressione. That goes a long way for advanced accordionists like Ludovica, who believe the accordionist is only as good as the instrument they play. I chose Pigini also for another reason, maybe the most important one, and because of, it's because of the sound these instruments have. It's really a unique and pure sound. It's always so elegant, and really I feel it is the real sound of the accordion, the classical accordion, which is the instrument I fall in love and uh, I want to play.